Hello everyone, and welcome to the 61st episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Steven from Django Unchained. The real brains behind the Candyland plantation, Steven is perhaps the most heinous and memorable example of an Uncle Tom to ever appear in cinema. An intelligent and opportunistic man who has no qualms about betraying his fellow man in order to get ahead in life. In this video, we'll cover the authenticity of this character, and then move on to take a look at every detail of this devious monster, from his deceptively feeble mannerisms to the subtleties of his speech and actions that make Steven a far more threatening villain than his supposed master could ever hope to be. But before we get into Steven, let's talk about our sponsor for this video, Star Trek Fleet Command. Star Trek Fleet Command is a story-driven game set in the Star Trek galaxy, one where you can interact with all your favorite characters, ranging from the original series all the way to the J.J. Abrams films. It features real-time combat, passive resource gathering, and loads of missions and events for you to partake in that will provide you with countless hours of entertainment. Hands down my favorite part of this game is the vast array of characters available for you to choose from, ranging from the more niche characters to the legendary, making you able to assemble quite the interesting crew from every generation if you so choose. Star Trek Fleet Command is completely free to play and download, and it's available on both iOS and Android, so you can get started playing it now on any device by clicking the link in the description. And for a limited time, when you reach level 5, you'll unlock a free Origins Michael Burnham, and if you reach level 10 by February 10th, you'll receive the materials you need to upgrade her to rank 2 for free as well. So dive into the Star Trek universe today by downloading Star Trek Fleet Command by clicking the link in the description. Thank you Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, let's begin. Let's start by briefly covering the history of house slaves. Now there's varying accounts of the authenticity of the claim that house slaves acted in much the same way as Stephen. Stephen enjoys quite the cushy lifestyle as Calvin's number two, and the veracity of his comfortable existence has some truth to it, as house slaves, without a doubt, enjoyed a better standard of living when compared to their field-bound brethren. But regardless, they were still slaves, and the work they had to perform in the house, while better in comparison to laboring in the fields, was still work. And along with having to perform all the menial and degrading tasks that needed to be performed in a large household, they were required to be on call 24-7 to serve the needs of their masters. As far as the relationship between the two, enmity did exist, and house slaves were often looked at by field slaves as privileged, stuck up, and traitorous, being that they were much closer to their oppressive masters. But here's the thing, the world we live in is hardly cut and dry, and it's not as if there were a universal rule that house slaves lived by. In all likelihood, some house slaves were much like Stephen, others were as hateful and resentful of their masters as any other slave, and others still were somewhere in between. It's even been said that house slaves were far more treacherous to their masters, as house slaves had access to all the resources available to their masters. And despite what Calvin says when he ponders why slaves don't turn on their masters, house slaves were much more likely to deceive their masters, and even kill them, considering that they were much more well informed about their private lives, and thus their weaknesses and vulnerabilities. So as far as how historically accurate the character of Stephen is, I'd say that most house slaves in his position were a mixture between his severity and a more compassionate soul. But it's also likely that there were indeed a few house slaves who were as terrible as Stephen, but they were the exception, not the rule. And with that out of the way, Let's move on and talk about this exceptional exception that is Stephen. Stephen was, in all likelihood, born on Candyland, as Django points out that Stephen has been at Candyland for 76 years. If he wasn't, he's definitely been there since he was young, and how and when he started serving in the big house is a mystery. Perhaps he was the son of one of the existing house slaves, like old Ben, or maybe he sucked up to the Candy family so well for so long that he earned his position of comfort. The latter may be just as true as the former, because above all, Stephen is an intelligent man, and an intelligent man would be well aware of how best to afford himself a better position in the world by expertly utilizing the hand he was dealt. Whether born a house slave or not, I'm sure Stephen either realized or was taught early on that the surest way to living a good life as a slave was to be as friendly and subservient to his master as he possibly could be. Now that's a good way to start, and I'm sure Stephen was quite amiable when engaging with Calvin's father and grandfather, but the best way to ensure that you're given an important position in a person's life is to shape their opinion of you when they're young, which Stephen undoubtedly did with Calvin. Growing up on a plantation, surrounded by slaves and his own family, I'm sure that aside from his sister and the few children he met on trips to town or who came to his home, there weren't too many people that Calvin could have called a friend when he was a child. Enter Stephen, 
a man who would perhaps play with Calvin, give him sweets, and spend time with him when his parents' busy lives prevented them from seeing their son. Thus, Stephen's hand in raising young Calvin cemented him in Calvin's mind as a friend as well as a pseudo-father figure, as children who are raised by household servants often find themselves becoming attached to the people who care for them alongside their parents. And over the years, as his parents and other impactful servants passed away, Calvin found himself relying on one person more and more as time passed, his mentor, friend, and near family member, Stephen. Which brings us to the events of the film, where we find that Stephen is far more friendly with Calvin than you would expect a slave to be. When we're first introduced to Stephen and he begins speaking to Calvin, he starts by joking with him in an almost offensive manner, telling Calvin that he missed him about as much as he misses a rock in his shoe, a remark that would have surely gotten any other person who dared to give lip to Calvin in such a way immediately killed or tortured. But not Stephen. He exudes a confidence in the presence of his masters that can only come from a man who's 100% sure that his position in this world is one of incredible value. To keep this position, Stephen has crafted for himself several different masks suited to different occasions. In front of the general public, he displays subservience, acting as a well-trained yet witty fool, his aged and crippled appearance disarming people with his display of average intelligence and harmlessness. We see this side of Stephen anytime he's in Calvin's presence in front of people, where he banters back and forth with his master and acts as his yes-man as we see when he repeats anything Calvin says to reaffirm his position, when he laughs at his jokes, and when he acquiesces to any request that Calvin makes, that is, after a healthy dose of snide retorts. When Stephen is dealing with his charge, the other slaves of the big house, we find him to be a much different man. We do see him joking in the kitchen before entering the dining room in one scene, but as we can see with Hildy, he has no reservations about sending the slaves that serve under him to be tortured or imprisoned, and his position as Calvin's lapdog ensures that his threats carry a lot of weight behind them, to the point where Hildy expresses the terror she feels when he's intimidating her, part of which comes from his menacing presence, and the other part from the fact that everything that Stephen says is backed up by Calvin. Then there's the side of Stephen that nobody gets to see besides Calvin and some of the other high-ranking white people of the Candyland plantation, and of course, those few who pay close attention to his mannerisms. Stephen is incredibly perceptive, and the best example of this keen perception of his is given to us during the dinner party scene. When Laura first remarks that Hildy has eyes for Django, nobody pays any mind to that statement, save for Stephen. In this moment, Stephen sees the distress in Hildy, and the moment of unrest in Django, physical indicators that one might take for momentary embarrassment at the revelation of one's affection for another person. But for Stephen, a man who has lived and thrived in this harsh world of human bondage by learning the ins and outs of the human soul, he knows that there's almost always something to be gained by watching the movements a person may not even know they've made. So Stephen accuses Hildy of having a relationship with Django, and though she lies, again, from her shoddy defense of her position, Stephen knows that there's more to be gained from this hunch. So he baits Django into revealing his true emotions, albeit only for a moment. But a moment, as we've seen already, is all Stephen needs. And with his confirmation of their relationship, he covertly advises Calvin to meet him in the library to reveal to him this information. Now here, Stephen proves that he's definitely the brains of Candyland, as Calvin didn't even have the inkling that he was being had. And Stephen proceeds to not only tell him of this deception, but of the doctor's plan which Stephen has worked out beautifully with just one suspicion. Now again, throughout this endeavor, Stephen proves to be far more intelligent than his master. But how? How is a household slave who was, in all likelihood, banned from receiving an education more intelligent than his master? Well, Stephen worked to earn an education in the shadows. Years and years of observation have educated him through sheer desire to improve his station in the treacherous world he lived in. From teaching himself to read in the vast family library in his free time, to listening to the children of the house being educated, to being present when important conversations on worldly matters were being held in the house, Stephen, little by little, earned the knowledge that he currently has. Calvin, on the other hand, earned nothing. Everything was handed to Calvin. His house, his clothes, his food, his servants, everything that Calvin Candy has was given to him. And what does Calvin Candy do with what he's been given? He plays. He watches Mandingo fights, he hangs out at social clubs, he hosts dinner parties, he drinks and smokes and lives the life of a hedonist, not so much as bothering to glance at the books in his library. While Calvin played, Stephen worked, and he worked so hard 
for so long that he managed to climb his way to the top of the hierarchy in Candyland, making himself its de facto leader, as Calvin deferred much of the day-to-day -day menial tasks needed to run Candyland effectively to his right-hand man. Now what's interesting about Stephen is that his friendship with and love for Calvin and his family isn't a ruse. If it were anyone else, you might think that Stephen was simply showing this affection to his masters to better deceive them, but no. At some point, Stephen decided that his fellow slaves mattered very little to him. Who were they but more unfortunate souls like himself with nothing to offer him? With the Candy family, Stephen was somebody. He wasn't just a household slave, he was a friend, a near family member, and arguably the most important man in their entire operation. It's no wonder then that Stephen would come to know true affection for these people, and there's no better evidence for this fact than the moment that Calvin Candy dies. Rushing to his side as his body falls to the floor, Stephen is utterly distraught as the man he loved more than anyone in the world falls into darkness, his sobs echoing over gunfire as despair overtakes his entire being. The boy he'd helped raise, the man he'd guided into his position, the friend whose company he had come to enjoy more than anything else in the world was gone. Now Django may not have killed Calvin, but Stephen had hated him the moment he had rode up to Candyland on his horse, a gaze of utter hatred emanating from his eyes as he watched this man defying the system he had come to enjoy. And again, though he didn't kill Calvin, Stephen knows he was the driving force behind Dr. Schultz coming to Candyland in the first place. And for that, Stephen marked Django as the uppity man who had taken everything from him and thus deserved to die. During the shootout that followed Calvin's death, Stephen assumes the role of leader that he had served from the shadows for so many years, ordering the white plantation workers to stop shooting so he can strike a deal with Django. After showing a bit of integrity when he tells Django that Hildy won't be harmed if he gives himself up, and squeezing some satisfaction from Django's surrender by making him repeat his acquiescence to his demands, we next find Stephen confronting a strung up Django in a barn. Here, he saves Django from mutilation, only to damn him to servitude in a brutal mining company. Here, we see Stephen once again expressing his intelligence and the influence he has over the rest of the Candyland operation by telling Django that Laura finally had the idea to send him to this mining company only after he'd repeated it several times. He states to Django that the reason he did this was because any torture that they could inflict upon Django at Candyland would be too good for him. Even letting Billy Crash cut off his sensitive parts would only result in him bleeding out in a few minutes, making the retribution that Stephen seeks far too swift. This is where Stephen reveals two things, one of which had been prevalent to a certain extent already, that being his sadism, and second, how much horror he's overseen during his tenure at Candyland. He thoroughly enjoys the thought of Django being tormented at the LaQuint Dickey Mining Company, explaining to Django his fate in detail with a cold satisfaction that shows his utter hatred for this man and desire for revenge. And while regaling Django with his fate, he muses about the horrid things that they do at Candyland to misbehaved slaves. Explaining this to Django, as casually as one might talk about the weather, satisfying his need to torment Django before he sends him off to his horrid fate. However, this fate was not meant to last, and Django returns to exact his own revenge upon these people who would see him and his wife put in perpetual bondage and torment. And in these last moments, Stephen reveals one last thing to us, that even his crippled appearance was nothing but a carefully crafted deception, as when he's the last man standing, he drops his cane and walks towards Django without so much as a stutter, showing us just how far Stephen was willing to go in order to worm his way into the good graces of his masters. Here, as defiant and obstinate as ever, Stephen dies a painful death, cursing Django and vowing that he would be brought to justice in the name of Candyland. And at this end, who was Stephen? He was a slave born just as unfortunate as the rest, but through his misfortune, this keen young man found that he could manipulate his way into becoming an important man, one whose value would assure for himself a comfortable position in this world of horrors. He was intelligent, condescending, rude, and cruel, adopting the thoughts and beliefs of his oppressors and putting them into practice with zealotry, becoming a man so fervently on the side of his masters that he molded himself into a more brutal and heinous representation of the institution they propped up. 
On the one hand, it's hard to blame a person for attempting to better their lives when they're thrust into such a horrible situation. But on the other is the fact that Stephen didn't just wash clothes and scrub floors to get ahead. He acted as a glorified slaver, standing witness to countless beatings, mutilations, and killings. And who knows, he may have even participated in some of these barbaric acts himself. When it comes down to it, Stephen is no better than his masters, and he's perhaps even worse than they, a man whose soul has been infected with the rot of racism, hatred, and brutality, one who stands before us as one of the most sickeningly disgusting examples of evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Stephen? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured in a future episode while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers and to my patrons, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.